Thank you guys for being here. If you need a handout, they're up here at the front. Um, but tonight, we are going to jump into the first of our topics, and that is anger. So with that, let's pray, and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, apart from which there would be no hope in what we are talking about tonight. There would be no reason to discuss these things because there would be no solution to this problem which is so common to man. But by your grace and because of your goodness, you have come and dealt with the problem of anger in our lives. And because of that, I pray that you would grant us understanding into this issue tonight, into how to address it, and Lord, that going forward, all of us would be that much wiser about when we are experiencing anger and when we see it in others and how we can help ourselves and the people around us to overcome the problem of anger through the power of the gospel. So I seek that tonight. We seek that tonight. God, give us wisdom from above in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. So, uh, what, I'm just curious, what does anger feel like? I'd like to get a kind of idea of your own guys' feelings. What's it feel like? Helpless. Helpless? Yep. Until you get a chance to let the person know how you feel. Mm. I know that's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so you feel like when you got anger, there's, there's just nothing I can do about it until I let that person have it. And then it kind of goes away. All right. Well, that's what it feels like. It doesn't mean that you have to be bad to it. I mean, treat them sure. disrespectfully. But sometimes you just need to let them know that what they did... Hurt you. <laughs> I'm in that there yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I get it. I get it. What's that, Larry? Sometimes you feel warm or hot. Okay. So, like the actual feeling of it is hotter. Yes. Yeah, your undershirt gets all soaked. <laughs> <laughs> Armpits get sweaty. Yeah. Heart, heart starts pounding. Yeah. All those things. Absolutely. Go ahead. I think uh, anger comes from the yesterdays. Mm. It can't come from your tomorrows. Is that when that come from the future? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It comes from your yesterdays, mm -hmm. and it um, you start to lose control. Mm. That's another really good, really good observation on the feeling of anger. It's about what's happened, not about what's to come, and the control piece. As that feeling of anger grows in us, I feel like we all lose more and more control of our responses, of our behaviors. Uh, on your sheet, you have a, a line of anger. The reason I put irritated at the beginning is because I think it's the easiest con to control. And the reason I put rage at the other end is because I think that's when we've completely lost control. Um, and that's just how I feel about it. But let's keep going. How does anger feel? Go ahead. I was gonna say it feels, a lot of times you wanna find somebody else to be angry with you to kind of justify, yeah, it loves you, company. you should be angry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It, it loves to find somebody who's like, your outrage is correct. And there is a reason for that. We'll dig into that. Go ahead. Oh. Did you have anything? No? no. Oh, I thought, okay, all right, all right, great. <laughs> Sorry. Any others on what does it feel like? Yeah, go ahead. It feels like a tidal wave. A tidal wave, okay, good. Yeah, just. Oh, man, it starts out, you barely notice, and all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just chaos. Just Feels like it. chaos, just yeah, it. absolutely, out of control. It, and it's kind of weird when you're, you ever been just completely angry inside, but the situation around you is just kind of normal, and, and you're like, why am I so chaotic in here when things are calm out there? Yeah, go ahead. There is a justifiable anger. Yeah, so... So an interesting thing about anger, and we'll get into this tonight, but it's closely related to justice. And uh, so we want to be always, we want to be justified in our anger. Um, I think sometimes we know our anger is justifiable and sometimes we know it's not. 
And I think when we're not sure, that's when anger loves company. It's like, am I? Oh, sorry? Your focus just goes down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you can't see the full picture anymore. You get so, you get so fixated on, on one thing. Yeah, and the more you get angry, the more that tunnel vision gets going. Okay. We got I think we've done a good job talking about the feeling of anger is like, what does it feel like when you start trying to deal with your anger? What is that feeling like? So you're angry and now you've noticed it and now you're trying to deal with it. Uh, I think that was great observation at the beginning, just that <laughs> it feels like you can't do anything about it. I can't get rid of this anger until I release it on the person who's, you know, causing it. Yeah, sometimes it feels like that, almost like a an ogre on your back until you let it go. What is, what is your experience like in trying to control anger or deal with anger? Come on, Christians. I know you've tried at least once or twice. What's, it like? Eat. What's that? Eat. Eat? Because you're angry, so mm -hmm. you eat out of frustration. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> it feels like eating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes we're angry about a situation. We can't control that. We can't seem to make ourselves feel better. And so we, so we eat or we work out. Some people go running. Some people punch a heavy bag. Some people go to jujitsu, right? Some people eat. Some people do all of the above. I'm specifically talking about a compulsive eater. Compulsive eater, yep, yep, yep. And eventually you can, you can have a, a behavior uh, for like self-soothing that you've done so much and so frequently that it becomes a it becomes a compulsion. Yep, 100 percent. And that is the other thing: the focus for justice becomes all about me. It does. I no longer can see yeah. the good. Yeah. In we'll talk that about that. We'll talk about what anger does to our attitude a little bit later. Very good. There's a book called A Brooding Anger. I'm sorry I don't have the physical copy with me, but I would write it down. What's the name of it? Uprooting Anger. Uprooting Anger. And he opens with the illustration of dealing with anger a lot like dealing with weeds. That you have this yard and you have this weed problem. And if every time a weed comes up, if every time you see a dandelion, you take that dandelion and you break it off at the stem and then tomorrow there's three dandelions and you break those off at the stem and the next day there's 14 dandelions and you break those eventually you just have a yard of dandelions even though you're constantly trying to get rid of them and he talks about anger like that that you know if you deal with the expression of anger if it's oh, I'm angry and you just break it off at the stem just oh, just gonna hold it in Eventually, your heart is just plagued by this. And like weeds, you've got to get to the root of anger uh, to finally have a yard where those dandelions don't show up anymore. Um, and so I would liken the, the dealing with anger, the uh, trying to handle it as controlling weeds. That's, that's often what it feels like. Sorry, go ahead. There a correlation between anger and depression? We will get into that much later. Okay, so I want to make the point tonight when we talk about anger, we're going to talk about kind of the most common forms of anger and the most typical ways that sh they show up in us. But we're going to get to later tonight when sometimes anger isn't really about the normal things resolved in anger and maybe it's related to sadness. Maybe it's related to fear. It's another super common one, especially with men, to get angry when they're scared. Um, and we'll talk, about, we'll talk about that. Very good question, though. In your guys' experience, when do people start to deal with their anger problem? When it's too late. When it's too late, yeah. And what does too late mean? By that point, that person's usually done what in their anger? Well, <clears throat> my observations are angers from other people, they lose their morality mm -hmm. and they start doing things that are illegal Yep. and then you have to put handcuffs on. Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, in a simpler way of saying exactly that, 
Most people start to deal with their anger when it starts to hurt other people. And hopefully you'll do it before you end up in handcuffs. But sometimes you don't and you end up in handcuffs and we go to prison and we can find a lot of guys still not handling their anger problem, even there. Very good. Uh, the other time where people start to deal with anger uh, is usually when they notice how much it's dominating their lives. When you just walk around mad all the time. And you, you know, the doctor tells you, oh my gosh, your spine's all bent over. The chiropractor's like, goodness gracious, what's wrong with you, right? They touch your back, it feels like mahogany because you're just tense all the time. Uh, and that's another time where people will start to deal with their anger. And so when you're in counseling and someone's coming to you with an anger problem, as you guys have already noted, it's usually too late. Meaning this person is well past the ability to handle their anger and they're in a place in life where anger is very much controlling them. They're walking around completely, if you will, drunk on the feeling of anger. They are under the influence of anger all the time. How do we talk about anger? Because here's the other part, is rarely do people come up and say, I've got an anger problem. How do we talk about anger? What are the words that we use? And I want to begin with the Bible and some of the Bible's most common words on anger. One of the words that the Bible uses to talk about anger is a very common word that we use to mask our anger. And it's the word irritate, right? I'm not mad at my kids. They just irritate me sometimes, right? All right. Uh, irritate. Uh, shows up one time in the Bible, which is great. I love that the Bible does this from time to time, and it just is like, oh, that word that you think dominates your feelings? Yeah, it shows up one time. And here's where it shows up, 1 Samuel 6, 1, 6. This is Hannah and Penaniah, right? Uh, they're both wives to the same man, and Hannah isn't able to have any kids, and the other wife is teasing her. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. It's literally the only time in the Bible that the word irritate shows up in the Hebrew or in the Greek. So just, just one. Usually the Bible is going to use a different word. So we use it all the time. We probably shouldn't. The next word that we use a lot is annoyed that I'm annoyed by something. I'm not mad, I'm just annoyed. There are two times in the Bible where this word shows up. The first is Judges 16.16, 16, and I love, <laughs> I love this. This is Samson and Delilah, 16.16. Uh, 16. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it, sick to death. Uh, could be directly translated annoyed. I love it. Was, she's just harping on him day after day after day after day. The Bible uses annoyed only one other time. It's Judges 16, or sorry, Acts 16. Uh, again, a woman. How interesting. I'm just kidding. Uh, 16, 18. She kept this up for many days. By the way, this is the demon-possessed girl who's following around Paul and his associates. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed, that's the word, that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the Spirit left her. Uh, so we use the word annoyed when somebody irritates us the very first time. We're like, I'm annoyed. Uh, which tells you a lot, because biblically, the word annoyed only shows up in two places, and it's after a long period of being irritated. Okay, and again, only twice. Irritate and annoy, only, only twice in the Bible. The word indignation. Uh, indignation is anger at injustice. And particularly when I'm on the receiving end of injustice. So uh, a husband whose wife has cheated on him should be indignant. That, that is a righteous form of indignation. Somebody who's, uh, you know, received a wrong and gone to court and the judge has not dealt fairly, they are going to have indignation. They've been, they've been dealt an injustice. Indignation or indignant shows up 14 times 
in the Bible. Rage, right? That uncontrolled outburst of anger. 58 times in the Bible. A thing to remember about rage uh, is that, one, it's that outburst of uncontrolled anger. That's the most common way that rage shows up. However, men and women alike will often use the appearance of controlled rage to scare someone. And so there's the difference between I'm really just out of control, angry, throwing stuff around the house, screaming, cursing, saying names, or I sit here seething, letting my face turn red, shaking, right, in anger, and I'm aware that what I'm presenting in that moment is a guy who's just about to snap. And uh, men, uh, well, p typically people just do this with people they're bigger than, right? So. I could do this with my wife, I could do this with my kids. It'd be harder for my wife to do this with me, but it'd be very easier for her to do this with the kids. And so rage also shows up like that, where it's not so much um, actual, like uncontrolled, it's actually quite controlled, and that makes it more sinister because we're using the appearance of rage in order to um, scare another person. You know, when somebody is really enraged mm -hmm. and they're talking like they're in complete control, and you know that what they're saying to you, yeah. you are not comfortable. Yeah. You know that, that they are furious. Yeah, furious, yeah, yeah. But they're not, and that makes it worse. Yeah. Because, yeah. Yeah, you're like, this is. Because they're saving all their energy yeah. to get here. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's what it feels like. That feels like, uh, and just like that. Uh, so rage shows up 58 times in the Bible. Bitter, super common word for anger. Uh, the picture of bitterness uh, that I think of, uh, Hebrews 12, 15, where the writer of Hebrews says, let no root of bitterness spring up between you two. Bitterness is a, um, it's a quiet anger, deep in the soul, and it hardens the heart into distance, into resentment, into unforgiveness. And once that root has taken hold, guys, it is really difficult to get that out. Um, as a picture of, of that root of bitterness, uh, I had a professor in seminary who told this wonderful, wonderfully terrible story about a woman right across the street from their church who um, was just a, a bitter woman. And like, for example, her neighbor was building like a an, uh, separate garage from the rest of the house. And she watched him every day, checked in on it, smiled at him, and just waited till he was done. And at the very end, she said, did you get a permit for that? And he was like, uh, no. So she called the city, and the city made him take it down, right? She didn't want him to have a permit. She just wanted, she just wanted him to put all this work into it and for it to, to blow up in his face. She gets diagnosed with cancer, and... Uh, and decides when she gets diagnosed with, with cancer to plant three big trees. And you know how like oftentimes there'll be the road and then a patch of grass and then the sidewalk. She planted the trees in that little patch of grass, three big trees. And uh, this pastor, the, the summary professor came and just asked, why are, you, why are you planting trees here? And she said, because I've got cancer and I'm going to die. And someone else is going to buy this house. And those trees' roots are going to come up and break the sidewalk. And they'll have to replace the sidewalk. What in the world, right? But uh, bitter, I don't know what happened to this woman. But, you know, she, that bitterness just took root in her heart, right? And she just sent it in every direction. Best part of the story is is she recovers from cancer and she has to replace her own sidewalk, right? God's justice is perfect. Bitterness, okay. I, you, you know, you just, you never know what happened to people. Oh, I don't, I don't think there's a person on the earth who could live with that. I don't know. Maybe there is, but goodness gracious. Wrath, next most common word you'll see in the Bible for anger. 
uh, oftentimes, uh, oftentimes attributed to the Lord. Wrath is very commonly associated to God. 188. And that's the expression of our anger, isn't it? The judgment. The judgment has come when we start getting wrathful. And lastly, of course, just the word anger itself is the most common word for anger in the Bible with 277 occurrences. In biblical, 188. We use another word. We use lots of different words. What are, what are some of the words that we use for anger? Those are the biblical ones. What do, what do we do? Ticked off. Ticked off. Yeah. Disappointed. Ticked off. Disappointed. Son, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. What else? Frustrated. Frustrated, yeah. What else? Words for anger. Mad. Mad, yep. <coughs> Any other words you guys use for anger? Upset. Upset. That's one of my personal favorites. I didn't put it in this list for the Bible ones, although the word upset comes up in the Bible so often. But the biblical kind of usage of the word upset is quite rich compared to kind of the pithy way that we use it to describe our anger in the U in, and not in the U.S., but in the English language. Um, upset, biblically, there's this concept of mourning behind it, of trouble in your soul behind it, of seeing the brokenness of a situation of the world and, and just kind of crying out to God. Um, and so uh, I didn't use upset, but we often use this in place of anger. Yes. Any others? <laughs> That's a strong one, yeah. What was it? Infuriated. Oh. <laughs> Infuriated. Whoops. Okay. Uh, one one word that we'll use uh, in place of anger is being critical. I'm just critical. Or some people say I'm just blunt. Or honest. Or honest. Goodness gracious, honest gets used and abused so often, right? The, the attitude here is the expectation that others will disappoint you or the situation will not satisfy you. That's critical. I'm going to go get dinner at church tonight and I'm going to assume that it's not going to be up to my standards. I, I walk in critical. I'm going to go to church on Sunday morning and they're going to sing four songs and I'll bet that I only like two of them. Joe's going to have a 40-minute sermon, and I'll bet he should have stopped at 33 minutes, right? We can be critical. Uh, and what we're, what we're doing is really putting ourselves up in the judgment seat and just seeing if everything comes up to our standards with the, with the attitude, with the expectation that it won't, that it won't. One other form of anger is somebody who likes to poke fun and kid and you can tell they're not kidding. You say something mean, and then you jump behind, ah, just joking, right? And it's a form of getting even. It's a form of, of getting even. By knocking others down, just a peg, just a peg. Peeved would be another one. These words, they're important. You need to, you need to be aware of them, because somebody, if you're talking to somebody with an anger problem, for whatever reason, they just don't want to say that they were mad and they don't want to say that they were angry. They will like to hide behind some of these other words. And um, it's just good to kind of remember the full family of words that really deal with this problem of anger. The last thing to say about this as we jump into this is that we can say something made us angry. Blank made me angry. And this gets to control. And I think for a lot of people, that's exactly what it feels like. I had no control. So-and-so said something, and I couldn't stop myself from being angry, so they must, they must have made me angry. That thing must have made me angry. Because I didn't feel like I had a choice. I didn't feel like I had a control. It must be their fault, right? Now, it is true. It is very true that we have very little control over the feeling of anger. I don't want to deny that for two seconds. 
Uh, anger is like a check engine light, right? It is letting you know what's going on inside. You have very little control over how much you feel of anger. How much you express of anger is a different story. But it's hard to control the feeling of anger. But it's not true that anybody can make you angry because, as Irv's already pointed out, this is from the past, meaning it's a response. Anger is born out of something that has happened to you. It's not like a spontaneous emotion that comes up. It is something happened to me and I'm responding in anger. Maybe that something happened to me years ago. I'm still responding in anger. And so it's not right to say anybody made me mad. And so again, when you're in counseling and, and this, somebody with an anger problem, I, without a doubt, is going to say, that made me so angry, they made me so angry, the situation made me so angry, and what they're doing is they're removing agency from this. And it may feel that way, but one of the most empowering things that we can do in the counseling room is remind people that they're, they do have control over their emotions, and particularly they have control over their responses. And so we need to get out of the, the mindset where oh, that person made me angry and, and show that person how they can control their response to anger. They're not a slave to anyone, actually. Um, and and we, need to, we need to make that clear. So I guess at certain points, it's probably important for us to define anger. This is not my, um, this is not my definition. This is from Robert Jones in his book, Uprooting Anger. So there's your author. There's your book. Just a fantastic book on anger. Really great. So he, he puts it this way. Um, and there's only one made up word in here, which is nice because a lot of times these Christian scholars come up with a whole bunch of made up words. So <laughs> our anger is our whole personed, that's the made up word, personed, our whole personed active response of negative moral judgment against perceived evil. It's really nerdy definition, but once you break it down, it's fantastic. So let's take it one piece at a time. Active response. Anger is the active response. You are engaged in anger. You're not in the passenger seat. You're, you're still driving this. You're still controlling yourself. And it's expressed, even, even if you hold the anger in. Even if you don't let it out publicly where other people can see it, you're still actively responding in the heart. Okay? So the first thing is that it's an active response. And second piece there, it's a response, right, to something else happening whole person, meaning that uh, anger has the unique, um, well, not, not alone, but anger, uh, when we talk about it feeling hot, raising our blood pressure, making us angry, uh, that's what's going on. It is a physiological reality and an emotional reality and a spiritual reality. It very much involves the whole person. <laughs> Response against so what did you say the whole person is physical emotional, spiritual emotional spiritual. yep yep these are yep these are up for grabs welcome guys good to see you no problem no problem so it is a uh, our whole person active response uh against uh response against a negative moral uh, sorry response against Oh, why did I do write it that way? Okay, next part here, negative moral judgment. Response against negative moral judgment. Or moral, yeah, judgment. Yep. I'm just going to leave it right there. The, um, the feeling of anger, and this gets back to justice. Uh, remember that all of our emotions come from God. Okay. When you have a feeling, uh, it, is, it is either put there by God, designed by God, or it is, or it is um, one of the ways that you image God. And anger is one of those things that when we look biblically, we're like, man, God gets angry. He gets mad. He gets wrathful. I mean, when we're talking about 
you know, 277 occurrences of the word anger. And the bulk of those are about God, not people. We have a God who's almost as angry as he is loving, right? Uh, which, is, which says a lot. Why is God so mad, right? And the answer is because there's some justice that's gone awry, whether towards him or from us towards one another. We'll get more into that later. But when we are angry, it's because we feel like we've been treated unjustly. Something just happened to me that shouldn't have happened. So you're sitting down here, you're eating a meal, and you, you put a cup of water up to your mouth, and somebody's not paying attention, they bump into you, and that water goes all over your face and all over your lap, and you get angry. What's the injustice? You made me look foolish. Okay, I look dumb. Now everybody looks at me, I've got water everywhere, I'm going to walk around with water. Yeah, and, and I didn't have to be that way tonight, but you've done this to me. This shouldn't have happened. You've done that. I am on the receiving end of injustice. Traffic. I'm going to work. I'm leaving 10 minutes ahead of work because that's the, how long it takes me to get to work. What? Traffic? How dare you, city of Yakima, do anything to keep these roads looking nice and clean and fixed and ready to use? On this day, do you, do you know who's driving to work today, right? It's justice. It's perceived injustice. It's you thinking that you deserve something that you're not getting every time. And that's why it images God. Because God is like, hey, you're not giving me the worship I deserve. Or hey, you're not treating each other the way you're supposed to be treating. And so he gets angry. Now for, the, for us, it's, it's uh, perceived. That's the word that's missing. That's the, the key word. Oh, that's in the next part. Uh, so it's a negative moral judgment. You're always making a, a negative moral judgment against perceived evil. That's, that's this last part that's super important. You see, because we're not very good judges. We're not very good at knowing what we do and don't deserve. Uh, and you can find that to be true. You know, um, anybody in here a millennial? I'm just curious. Am I the only millennial? Thank you, Hannah. We're not alone. All right. <laughs> Uh, any boomers in the room? Okay. Boomers, when you look at the millennials, do you think we're a little entitled? A lot. a lot entitled? Yeah. I'll bet there's other generations that look at you and think the same thing, right? It's perceived. We all think we're, we deserve something different. And yeah, you can ask millennials, what do you guys think you deserve? I think I deserve a job that pays over $100,000 a year. From the very beginning, I think I should have all the things right now that it took my parents 30 years to acquire. You know, I think that uh, I should never have to work a holiday or a weekend. That's what I think. I think I just, health care, retire, I, that's, I mean, is that too much to ask? And that's how I'm And then, you know, the boomers look at them and say, do you guys, you know, do you, you guys realize it took us like 30 years to get all this, right? And then the greatest generation of the depression are people like, look at, wait, what are you talking about, right? And on and on it goes. We all have different levels of entitlement. And when we get those things, we all have different levels of perceiving the injustice being, being dealt to us, which is why you can have people out in the streets um, protesting that they don't have things that, at least from your perspective, they don't deserve. But in their perspective, they do, that there's been an injustice, right? Perceived evil. Perceived evil. This is why anger images God, but it's also why it's broken. Because we are poor judges. We're not very good at knowing what's actually wrong. Which is why when somebody bumps us by accident and we spill water on ourselves, we get angry. We have no right to be angry. They didn't do that on purpose. And it's just water. You're not special. You're not so special that you should never have water splashed on your face. There's not some great evil in the world that has caused this to be. That's not the curse, right? Um, and it's definitely not something that you could get angry at this individual about. And so that's, that's anger. And I've kind of really focused on the uh, evil side of it. Let's talk about when is anger righteous then, right? Everyone, everyone's like, well, I don't think I was sinful in my anger. I think it was righteous anger this time. Okay, well, let's get into that. Now, the perfectly righteous anger, if you're looking for any example of it, you've got to go to God himself. 
God alone, God alone is the right judge, right? And he tells us terrifying things. He tells us that if you're guilty of breaking one sin, you're guilty of breaking all, which we don't like that. That doesn't add up to our sense of justice, but the true judge of all knows what's truly right and truly wrong. Psalm 2 is one kind of, that you could, you could broadly divide God's anger into two categories, broadly. And one is anger for his own sake. Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers, of ba- and the rulers band together against the Lord and his anointed saying. So the, the people, the nations of the world are rising up against God and they say, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Let's rebel against God. Let's do what we want. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath. So when people don't give God his just due, his right response is anger. And if you look at God's word, you look at what his people are doing when they are not worshiping him as they should be, when they're not giving him what is his due, he gets angry. The second form of injustice is when people mistreat one another. And for that, I'm going to go to Isaiah chapter 9. If you, if you don't think this is a big deal, I would encourage you to spend this year studying Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Daniel, if you like, but primarily Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah. And in those three, you will discover how much God cares about the widow and the orphan and the oppressed of the land and how angry he is with his people when they do not take care of them. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. All right, so Isaiah chapter 9 Um, verse 21 through 10 verse 4 yet for all this his anger is not turned away his hand is still upraised woe to those who make unjust laws to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless What will you do on the day of reckoning when the disaster comes from afar? To whom will you run for help? Where will you leave your riches? Nothing will remain but to cringe among the captives or fall among the slain. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. What made God angry as he looked at the nation of Israel was how they treated the poor and how they treated the widow. Uh, you guys, if you want, you could go look at Isaiah chapter 58 and you could go see how God, the, the people of Israel are, are fasting. They're going to Bible study. They're seeking the will of the Lord, but on the day of their fast, they extort their worker. They beat their wife. And God says, is this the fast that I've sought from you? He says, go, go take care of the widow and the orphan. He says, go put the homeless in your house. God gets angry with us when we don't take care of the widow and the orphan. When we are unjust towards one another, he gets angry. So man's anger. God's anger is always righteous. It's always righteous. If you're looking for the gold standard, if you're wondering, how am I supposed to feel about this homeless situation? You should feel the way that God feels about this homeless situation. And you should read his word to see how he feels about it. Man's anger, Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 through 32. This is one of the most intense moments of man's anger in all of God's word. It is the golden calf. And it begins like this. God tells Moses, go back down. They've made an idol. I'm going to kill them all. 
And Moses says in chapter 32, verse 9, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, sorry, and they are stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that in my anger, so sorry, that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. And then I'll make you into a great nation. God's like, it's all good. I don't need the descendants of Israel. I'm going to kill them all. We're going to start over with you, Moses. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord as God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt with your great and mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains or wipe them off the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce anger, relent, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, to whom you swore by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance forever. So Moses' anger begins with God's glory and the good of the people. Then the Lord relented and did not bring his people, the disaster he had threatened. Moses turned and went down the mountain with two tablets, the covenant of law in his hands. They were both, uh, they were scribed in both hands, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on those tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. Moses replied, it's not the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. When Moses approached the camp, he saw the calf and the dancing, and his anger burned. And he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. You guys who like to throw and break things, you're like, yes. And he took the calf the people had made, and he burned it in the fire, and he ground it to powder and scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. And he said to Aaron, what did these people do to you that led them into such great sin? Do not be angry, my Lord, Aaron answered. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to us, or said to me, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. So I told them, whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And they gave me the gold and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> it's ridiculous, right? Moses saw that the people were running wild, that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughing stock to their enemies. So he stood at the entrance to the camp and said, whoever, it's so important guys, he's angry. He's angry. But look at who he's angry for. Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites rallied to him. And then he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, killing, each killing his brother, and friend and neighbor. And the Levites did as Moses commanded. And that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, you have been set apart for the Lord today. For you were against your own sons and brothers and he has blessed you this day. The next day Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. But now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold, but now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. That's righteous anger on man's scale. There's nothing we need to fix in Moses' anger. Is Moses' anger about him or about God? It's about God. He doesn't care about some injustice done to him. Well, part of it's kind of a temper tantrum. I don't think he should have thrown down those... <laughs> those tablets? That God just gave him. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, so I don't think it's by accident. The, no, tablets, no. Yeah, the yeah. tablets were the, the covenant, right? right? So this is the promise. You guys obey this, I'll give you life. And so when he goes to the camp, it's like before the covenant's even begun, he's, they've already broken it. So back in 19, if you go back there, there there's a covenant-making ceremony. And then, so it's like a picture of the covenant already being broken. I don't think it's him actually just having a temper tantrum. I think he's saying, the covenant, you guys, you guys have already broken the covenant. So I think, that's, I think that's what it's about. But good, yeah, good observation. I don't think it's a temper tantrum. Nor is it a temper tantrum when he says, go kill everyone, which is crazy. 
That's what he said. This is what the Lord has said. The Lord was about to kill everybody. And the Lord said, whoever's with me, you're going to go and kill your brother. And, and then only 3,000 die instead of everyone. So it's mercy, which is the other incredible thing about that story. Can you imagine killing your own brother? I cannot. I cannot. <coughs> Their anger isn't about themselves. It's about the Lord. Righteous anger is not about us. It's about God. And even in our righteous anger, if we love our brother more than we hate them, then we're in the right spot. If we hate them more than we love them, we're in the wrong spot. You could imagine that Moses had come down and seen the scene of the golden calf and said, uh, you know what, Joshua, we're going right back up the mountain. God, I changed my mind. Kill them all. But that's not what Moses does. He obeys God's instruction. He kills some. And what he does is he's, he's Father, forgive them. And if you won't, take me too. So in the midst of his anger, is there love? Yes. Great, great love. What was that sentence you just said? Righteous anger? Something in the midst of his anger, is there love? Yes. Great, great love. Yeah. So that's righteous anger. Righteous anger is going to be upset on God's behalf because there's recognition that justice primarily is about him. And then, and then the love piece there as well. And so could I get mad if I see a bully beating up somebody else? Yes. So also it would be good. Does God get mad when we treat each other unjustly? Yes. Should I get mad then when people treat each other unjustly? Yes. Yes, that is the right answer. So if you're driving and you see somebody getting beat up in an alleyway and you laugh, that's the wrong answer. And if, and if, if it makes you angry, that's the right answer. But it should make you angry because of the injustice. It should be, make you angry because of what, what's being done against the Lord. And we'll talk later about how we're supposed to deal with that feeling of righteous anger in light of the gospel. Oh my gosh, it's 6.54. What are we gonna do? Oh no, all right, I'm sorry guys, I shouldn't have, well, I enjoyed reading all of Exodus 32. I think it's a good example of, I don't feel bad about any of this. Okay, we're gonna go to another text, James chapter four, verses one through three. We might have a, we might have a, we might have a part two for this class. If this is how this keeps going, I am not going to be able to deal with all the things I want to talk about. So, James 4, what? 1 through 3. James 4, 1 through 3. Because now we need to talk about unrighteous anger. We've talked about righteous anger and what that looks like. James 4, 1 through 3. Oh, no. I ask you things that are on the sheet, but I don't see them. That's my problem. It's on the bottom of the second page. So James 4, 1 through 3, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Why do you get angry? Would be another way to ask that question. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have. I'm not getting what I want, perceived injustice. So you kill. You covet but cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. It's us fighting to get what we think we deserve. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And there in a nutshell, we have, I think probably 95% of the anger that you and I feel on a daily basis. I want that and I'm not getting it. And so I'm mad. We'll talk about Anger related to depression, related to fear, but the bulk of the anger we're experiencing is I'm not getting what I want and I'm mad. We'd never get past being two. We just don't. We get better at explaining it, we get better at disguising it, but we just don't get past the sin nature of a two-year-old. So as we think about this from a, um, a root perspective, you can't get to uprooting anger 
if you don't get to the root of the issue. So as we think about getting to the root of anger, the very first thing to look for, the very first thing we need to recognize is unmet desires. As you are looking at an angry person, as you are experiencing anger, think of anger as the check engine light. What does this car want that it's not getting? You know, is it, does it need oxygen? Does it need electricity? Does it need fuel, right? And when you're talking to an angry person, what's the thing that they want that they're not getting? Secondly, remember that justice, justice is a part of this. And again, why is justice a part of this? Because anger for us, it comes from God, right? And this is why God, that's God's response to injustice is anger. And so there's always some kind of justice. Uh, we get angry, we're not getting what we want, and what we usually say is, it's just not fair. That's a, that's a judgment about justice. So as you talk to somebody and they're dealing with anger, as you're thinking about your anger, where, where is the justice involved in, in all of this? And then three, and this, is, this deals with that other 5% of anger, is there some translation going on here? And so now I want to talk about Sometimes depression shows up as anger. Sometimes fear shows up as anger. Why? For a variety of reasons. It changes from person to person. Um, one is that, like with like fear, for instance, a lot of times anger is not different than what Christina was talking about earlier, uh, eating. So eating being a comfort-seeking behavior in the midst of anger uh, so, or in the midst of um, anger. So fear, right? Sometimes anger, getting angry, being big and scary is a way of protecting yourself, right? Um, depression, some people get, they go crazy with the numbness of depression and the only other emotion they can really register is anger. And so to feel anything at all, sometimes they get angry. This is different for different people. You can just keep this in the back of your mind. It's not typically the case. But if you start to go down the unmet desire route and you're like, I'm not finding anything here. We keep digging and I'm not uncovering anything. Well, now it's time to think, is there some emotional translation going on here? Is depression actually the source of this or is um, fear actually the source of this? I would say that this is, uh, at least in my experience, it's less common. I have very limited experience. I think there's probably different cultures in the world where that's like a kind of a normal way for somebody to deal with their feeling of fear. Um, I think of like kind of growing up in like inner city environments, uh, a lot of gang life, a lot of dealing with fear through anger. So that might be really common in, in situations like that. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, but it's not, not to erase just that one, erase all three. Um, but that's, that's something to think about as we're getting into kind of uncovering the root of anger. Uh, so here, what I would do if somebody is coming with a pattern of this problem is maybe you use the life story and you start kind of breaking down the history of anger. Maybe you just have them think, what times do you most frequently get angry? Uh, you know, I get angry every day when I come home from work. I get every day, uh, angry every day when I'm at work. Uh, every time a customer comes up to the front and they don't introduce themselves, I get angry, right? Like just try to identify the pattern of anger if you can. And then what I like to do with this, uh, which, which we've already done, is I would like to use the heart model. And I like to just kind of, okay, help me unpack this moment, a, a particular instance of anger, and pick a good one, right? That's why you would kind of try to identify the pattern. And, um, and with that, begin to work through all of these issues. Tell me about what was going on. And you begin to fill the outside. And then you're going to start asking questions about the heart. You're going to first think about desires that aren't being met, right? So um, last week talked about the affections manifesting as emotions, right? So you guys might remember like the underneath, there was underneath and then there was the surface, right? And over here, there was affections. And on the other side was emotions. Uh, desires, if you will, and then emotions. Um, so obviously we're dealing with the emotion of anger. 
So all you're doing is you're seeing anger as a rope, okay? And you're, you're following the rope of anger from the emotion back to the affection, back to the desire of the heart, okay? So when you're seeing someone who's angry, that's the surface. You're, you're gonna just dig. You're gonna look for what is it that this person is seeking? What is it that they're wanting? And then you're gonna think about their beliefs, their thoughts, right? And uh, remember that that often shows up as intuitions. So I, I just, you know, I think this, I feel that. You're, you're, you're pulling those thoughts in the midst of anger. Uh, you're looking at what their, ex, what their expectation is, what they believe the situation should have gone as, and you're following that back to a set of beliefs. How do they define the problem? So, so it's this simple question, what went wrong? right? They're going to tell you what the problem is that you follow that back to their beliefs. Another question, what would have fixed it? What would have made everything okay? What's the solution, right? And they go, oh man, if, if so-and-so had just done X, Y, Z, okay, great. I'm going to follow that. When so-and-so does this, you think that's going to make you happy. Okay. That's the surface level. I'm going to dig into that. What's the underlying belief that that, that that proposition rests on, that intuition rests upon. So expectations, problems, solutions, and then the will. <clears throat> the will. So once the feeling of anger shows up, how, how does it get expressed? What's the attitude of this individual, right? So, you know, like a 15-year-old boy coming home from school and his mom says, hey, could you put your backpack up on the, co he just, ugh, right? Uh, attitude, right? We, we can recognize it in other people very quickly, but you're going to find the will, the will of the heart expressed often in the attitude that somebody has. So as we think about thoughts, beliefs, and that was, that was will. So we think about thoughts and beliefs. What would be some questions that you would ask somebody to uncover what they were thinking when they were, when they were angry. What happened first, second, third? And then why do you think first, second, third happened? Very good. Just tell me the story. Just tell me what happened in, in that story, the details that they give you, there's going to be thoughts that come out in that. Why did X lead to X? Why did, or X lead to Y? Very good. Let's, let's follow the logic in there. You're going to uncover their thinking. Uh, as, as you do this with someone, I, I highly recommend you, you do the best you can to get them to slow down and just think through their thoughts. Think through their, what was the next thought? Okay, so they bumped you with the water. What was the very first thought that came to mind? as they bumped you with the water. Okay, then what happened next? Well, the water spilled. Okay, what was your next thought when the water spilled out, right? Just, just simply at what, it, what was the next thought? What was the next thought? What was the next thought? Those questions I brought up earlier, what, what was wrong with all that? And when you're asking what was wrong, you're getting to their concept of justice. They're gonna tell you what they think justice is and justice isn't. And we ask them what the solution is. They're going to tell you what, where they think righteousness lies in this. And one, another question you can ask is, if you could go back and fix that situation, what would you do now, right? And then another question is, and how is that different than what you thought the solution was then? Through these sorts of questions, again, you're going to uncover what they're thinking, and I think the most important question that, we're, that this person will almost never be thinking is, what is God doing in that moment? What was God up to? And, and they'll, they'll tell you one way or the other. They might tell you that they were an atheist for a while, just to believe there was no God. He wasn't involved in that situation. Or they might think God's a bully. Uh, next is you unpack the feelings and the desires. You can explain to them, and I would, the re relationship between feeling and desire, right? And you could, you could make that very simple, right? Um, when I taught you guys the biblical counseling class, I think last time, and maybe I even brought up in the X class, 
uh, ice cream. Somebody knocked over my ice cream and I'm mad about it, right? You can, you can very easily show the difference between, or the, the relationship between desire and emotion. And so you ask them, as you started to get angry, what did you want most? And they never tell you the root idol, ever. That what they say is, I just, I just wanted to get to work on time, okay? What does getting to work on time get you, right? <coughs> What does that mean for you? And you might uncover, like, as you continue to dig, that, dig through that, that it's a sense of doing a good job at work. It's uh, about image. It could even be a good thing, like being a good steward of your time. You'll, you'll uncover that. Um, but you have to, don't, don't stop at just that object of desire. Really get that into a biblical category. Keep digging at what's there. Often, yeah. Yeah, so when we think about like the anger example that I used, like I want my wife to stop being a bother. What do I really want? I want rest, right? And you're digging for that. You're digging for that, that idolatrous desire or that straight up evil desire. Nothing evil about desiring rest. It had just become a dominant desire in the heart. Um, you could ask them to kind of explore when did you become aware of your anger? Right? You could ask them to explore, did anger take you by surprise? Right? That tidal wave feeling. And if it did, what was the thing that brought you up to that peak? What did you wish you could do? If you had a magic wand in that moment, what would you have done? Right? And again, that'll get you to an idea of what they desire. And what does that thing give you? What does that thing, if you, if you had that thing, what, what does it give you? What does it mean to you? Uh, you're, you're unpacking the desire, you're unpacking all of that there. The will, down here, how did you express your anger? The feeling of anger bubbles up, how did you choose to handle it? Did you stuff it down? Did it lead you to pull away? Did it lead you to attack? Um, how frequently do you do that? So, uh, I get angry and I smack the table. How frequently did you, how frequently, is that a common thing for you to do is, Pound the table when you get angry. Curse, you know, whatever. And, and you, you look at what that expression is, and that's going to tell you a lot about the will. And I think the last thing that's important to do is kind of figure out where is my anger headed? Am I mad at God? Am I mad at myself? Am I mad at others? Or am I mad at my situation? And often, by the way, if someone's mad at their situation, they're actually mad at God. Um, it's just that some of us don't have a very good idea of God's sovereignty. And so maybe in the counseling room, you end up spending just a couple weeks talking about the sovereignty of God until this person realizes, oh, the bone I have to pick is with God about my situation in life. From there, uh, we try to... So now you've, in that process, hopefully you've worked through this, you've found beliefs that, that need to be corrected, right? Ideas of justice. Ideas about what I deserve, ideas about how life should be that need to be changed. Hopefully you've gone through the desires and you've, you've recognized, okay, there are, um, there are desires here that have become idolatrous or controlling. I know it needs to be repented of there. And then maybe you've identified the will as well. Uh, when we get angry, you guys remember, maybe you remember this from the book of Counseling class, we, we typically, we're trying to fix the scales of justice in one of two ways. One, we make someone... Uh, get beat up. We, we beat them up with our words. We beat them up with our anger. We beat them into submission to get them to do what we want, right? Or we pull back and we say, you can't have any of my love because you've offended me. Um, if you look at the case study at the end of this, you could just go home and read that tonight and think, how would I go about dealing with this? But the husband, when he gets angry, you'll notice that it goes out and then the wife, when she gets angry, you'll notice that she withdraws. And you could, you could imagine how that might lead to a rift in a marriage. Okay, so you repent of the evil desires, you repent of the idolatrous desires, and you submit the idolatrous desire to the Lord. This is the hardest part of doing counseling with someone with an anger problem. Because somebody with an anger problem thinks that the problem is everybody else but themselves. 
And so the point where it's like, okay, how do I, in, how, how in the world do I get this proud man to realize he's the one who's offended God? You can't. You cannot. That is uniquely the work of the Holy Spirit. So you can point out to a brother his sin, but you can't make him repentant. And the best thing you can do is get somebody to go kind of explore their own heart, for them to begin to see their idols, for them to begin to see the lies, for them to begin to see their will and just how nasty it is. And just pray that as you expose someone's sin to them, that the Holy Spirit will do the work of convicting them and that they'll repent. But I can say that a lot of times this is an impasse in biblical counseling. You're dealing with an angry person who, and, and this, is, this happens a lot, their anger is rooted in what happened to them, the injustices that they received. Well, they're never able to be repentant because they're always thinking, but that was done to me. But that was done to me. But that was done to me. And they're never, never able to see that their sin against God is greater than that person's sin against them. So without the power of the Holy Spirit, guys, this is an impasse in biblical counseling. You can do a lot of good conversing. And a lot of it will stop here unless the Holy Spirit is involved. That person then, after they've repented, will have to surrender their desires to God and exercise active faith back to James 3 that he will give me what I faithfully ask in his name the moment that I need it. So back to James 3 or James 4. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The idea then being that if you were to ask with right motives in Jesus' name, the things that he would have for you, right? He will give you exactly what you need in, your, in, in his time. And, and so that's, that, is your, that is your active faith at the end of that repentance process. It is 7.15. Oh, okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this down here. I, so I'll just tell you right now, we're probably going to have to ex, not maybe extend this class. I don't know. Maybe I'll do it online. Maybe we'll pick it back up in the fall. I don't know. But I think we're only going to make it through like three or four topics, <laughs> uh, which will be fine. Uh, so we can do more later on. But I, I want to I do justice to this anger process. Um, so we're going we're gonna to pause it right here, and we'll pick, at, pick back up with renewal next week. Okay? Let me pray for us. And... That'll be it for tonight. Lord God, we thank you for our time here tonight. We thank you for your word and how it uncovers the heart and it shows us what anger really is. God, and when we look in the mirror, it is nasty. We don't like what we see. We don't like what we would do to get justice. So God, would you save us? Would you save us from our own brokenness? Would you free us from the controlling influence of anger? And would you set our feet on the rock? Would you teach us to live and walk in love and humility? That's what we ask. That's what we desire, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So next week, uh, real quick, we'll finish out the notes. Um, the case study at the end, I, I would encourage you to read that. And we'll spend a lot of our time next week talking about how we might handle that case study. All right? Good night, everyone. <laughs>